We're going to get started for our uh, last session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Fan Lee, who's here at Duke in the Department of Statistical Science. She also has a secondary appointment in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Her primary interest is in uh, causal inference, and she's going to tell us about how uh, machine learning for causal inference is a cautionary tale. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the uh, coming to Durham and uh, for this wonderful conference. So, um, so what I'm going to talk, I have 25 minutes, and I want to be pretty uh, uh, informal. I have, uh, again, I've done my primary interest has been uh, causal inference. And of course, as everyone in the field that recent years, I hop on the bandwagon of machine learning. So I learned a few things, um, you know, from my own experience. So I want to share that uh, with, uh, with you guys. So just quick, just, just quickly uh, recap, well, not recap kind of, uh, so what is causal inference? Causal inference in healthcare is often known as the uh, comparative effectiveness research. So essentially the goal is simple, is try to compare patient outcomes between two or more treatments. Okay, you want to know whether A or B is better, okay? So of course we know that as Fisher told us 100 years ago, randomized control trial is a gold standard. Okay, if you can do that, you know, that, then you don't need to do causal inference. <laughs> but uh, obviously, um, randomized trial is not always feasible. So in recent years, observational study have been increasingly used. And uh, as everyone know, uh, working in this field knows a bit that the biggest problem of using observational study for causal inference is confounding. Um, so I'm not going to introduce this as what is confounding, just assuming that, you know, this is common knowledge. Um, so again, causal inference has been, um, you know, the, the, the foundation has been laid actually by Fisher and Neyman um, almost, almost 100 years ago. And then in 70s, of course, Don Rubin uh, did a, a series of fun, fundamental work, uh, foundational work uh, to introduce potential outcomes framework. And then in the, in the 80s, you have propensity score. And then in the 90s, uh, and also in 80, Jamie Robbins did a lot of uh, wonderful work in the uh, longitudinal treatment. So, so only, but, but only in the, I would say in the last 10 years, you can see that this uh, huge, uh, causal inference become a huge surge. Uh, in the in academics and also in industry and uh, now of course we're coming fast forward we're coming to this uh, machine learning era so the, uh, the 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 last 10 years also there's a surge in machine learning and then of course these two fields uh, kind of start to interact with each other and uh, so we see a lot of work in the combining machine learning and causal inference particularly in the domain of uh, estimating heterogeneous treatment effect so then you hear all this, uh, you know, very uh, famous uh, methods called uh, causal forest, the super learner, or double machine learning. And also, of course, we also increasingly see that the, in the instrumental variable uh, framework, also they are combined a lot of machine learning methods uh, come into play. Okay, so before I, so before I actually go to the, uh, um, the main point, I just want to point out one thing that's, uh, we often ask, what is machine learning? Of course, it's, it's, it's such a big concept. It's very hard to, uh, to introduce, to, to say it. But the, the point I want to make is, I, I, I quote this uh, 2018 JAMA paper. Machine learning is really a spectrum. So the point is that, you know, machine learning is a spectrum. Uh, it, it's really a continuum between fully manually guided versus fully machine guided data analysis. Okay, so it's basically as you, you know, as humans impose fewer assumptions on the algorithm, it moves further up in the machine learning spectrum. Okay, so there's never a specific threshold at each, at which point you say, ah, I'm not doing machine learning. Okay, so it's not like that. It's just, you know, it rather all of these approaches exact, uh, exist along a continuum um, and determined by how many human assumptions are placed into the algorithm. And of course, the, even the old, good linear regression we use is machine learning. But of course, I mean, that, that's, that's one point I think is important to, to point out. But of course, when we talk about machine learning, we usually mean something. So particularly the, the popular machine learning method, like the, the, the older machine learning methods people know, this is those lasso, variable selection, decision tree, or ensemble learning, those methods, right? But of course, only in, in the recent years that the deep learning has a huge surge in the big data era. 
for example, we, we see that the, the, the great success of deep learning, uh, imaging data and text data analysis in natural language processing, all of those things. Okay, so, so when we talk about machine learning, we are having like the, the, the older machine learning, older is still like younger than most of the linear regression, of course, but also we have the deep learning thing. And I would say that the uh, in most of the machine most of the machine learning methods for causal inference actually still concentrated in the uh, in the lasso decision tree ensemble learning that kind of slightly older machine learning that domain and they are more and more getting to the deep learning side but that's uh, that's not the uh, but that that's still that area is still growing but it's still relatively small but the point I will I will make is whether it's a whether it's the deep learning or the more traditional machine learning, um, the key thing is not machine learning. The key thing is actually causal, causal inference, because fundamentally you want to do causal inference. Uh, machine learning is a toolbox. Okay. So, so my question is, uh, the question is, okay, so we have this wonderful tools now called machine learning, but is machine learning really the magic wand in uh, causal inference? Of course, the answer is no. Um, so to, to make that point, I want to talk about this basic con concept in, in causal inference. So in causal inference, if you're slightly familiar with the um, potential outcome framework, you know that the fundamental uh, problem of causal inference is like, so, so causal inference is really like you want to compare the patient, had this patient been treated by treatment A versus had this patient treated by treatment B, what's the difference, right? But in reality, you can only treat the patient once, either A or B. So the other side is counterfactual. So you are actually not doing really prediction. You are doing this so-called counterfactual prediction. Okay. So that is slightly different. So so that that if I go this like so machine learning models are usually designed for prediction. But if we think of what is called the inference, it's actually about contra counterfactual prediction. Okay. So called the inference is actually not simply a two-arm prediction problem, because if you want to compare. The key thing is you want to compare two groups, right? Two treatments. So you want to compare apples versus apples, oranges versus uh, oranges. So confounding mess that up. And so so that is so in causal inference, we often say that well, it has causal inference has two causal studies usually have two stages. The first stage is called design. The second is called analysis. So what is the design stage? Uh, broadly speaking, design stage is just first you you come up with a design to acquire data. And then second is you actually specify the so-called causal estimate, basically the, the target of your estimation. And the third is you start to make necessary assumptions. Remember half, because we, the fundamental problem of causal inference is like, well, you want to do compare counterfactuals, but you observe at most half of the counterfactuals, right? That's the hard part. So in order to do that, you have to make assumptions. And then the first, so so once you say what I want to ask, what am I called as men? Then you make necessary assumption. And the last one is then you use tools like matching, weighting, whatever to meet, to make the data so that the data meet those assumptions. And so, so, well, and sometimes you cannot use an analytical method to do that. So that's the design stage. Design stage is basically anything uh, involving data before actually you look at the outcomes. So the analysis stage is given the design stage or the assumptions. Then you use statistics or machine learning models to estimate, uh, to have the, to, to analyze the data in hand and then as a causal effect. So Don Rubin in 2009 have this uh, famous you know, saying, which I completely agree is uh, for causal inference design trumps analysis. So the key point is that if your design is good, then even if your analysis, you use the simplest analysis, like just compare two groups, uh, difference in means, you are good. It, in fact, we can prove that actually in randomized experiment, if, even if your model is wrong, you can still get a consistent estimate, okay? But if your data is pretty messy, like it, it, the data come is kind of is very noisy, not well sorted out, then you know, you, leave, you have very me messy data. So there's no analysis can fix so that is in the situation called this garbage in, garbage, garbage out situation, okay? So that is, a... okay. So, um, so again, I just want to give this kind of background uh, info. Um, so 
as I mentioned earlier, cold inference is about counterfactual prediction. So it is not an easy two cent two arm prediction problem. So so the key point is that machine learning is great. It expands the toolbox of analysis stage of cold inference, but machine learning does not touch the design stage at, at the current current stage. That does not automatically solve the problem in the design. And as I mentioned earlier, in cold inference design actually is the most important thing. Okay, so machine learning does not automatically magically solve the design problem. So you still want to make sure that, you know, if you have observational data, you want your data to be, look as much as possible to a randomized trial because that's a gold standard, right? But machine learning does not help you to do that. So you still have this overlap, balance, unconfoundedness issue, all of that. So, you know, automatically, I noticed many times, automatically apply machine learning models, even though that's the most advanced model, deep learning models, whatever, to directly to causal problems, sometimes cause more harm than benefit. Um, so I'll give two examples. The first, and both are pretty famous uh, papers. So, so the first example, <laughs> I call it the curse of multiple causes. So this is based on this paper. This paper is a very well-known but controversial paper in 2019 by Wang and Bly. Dave Bly, of course, is a very famous person in machine learning, right? So this is a JASA discussion paper. JASA is the top journal in, uh, in statistics. Uh, that, and this is a discussion paper. So it's very impactful. So the paper's name is called The Blessing of Multiple Causes. Okay. So in order to explain this, I need to give a little bit background. So background is that in causal inference, very often, like in most of the causal inference study, it's for observations, we make two assumptions. The first assumption is unconfoundedness. Basically say there's no unmeasured confounding. Okay, so this is a very strong assumption, but and this assumption is untestable, and it's probably questionable in many observational study, but many like, a large majority of causal analysis are making this assumption. Okay, so this attracts a lot of, you know, uh, people, particularly people who come to causal, causal inference, uh, nay person always start to attack this, say you, you causal guys always use unconfoundedness, but how can you, uh, how can you make sure that that is really the case, right? So, so the key point is that this is untestable, questionable, but widely used. Second assumption is called overlap. This assumption basically say that every unit you consider, every patient has non-zero probability of being assigned to each treatment. So what does this mean? <laughs> this basically means that, you know, basically each, you cannot have, you cannot compare some patient, if there's some, if one patient can only be assigned to one treatment for medical reason, whatever, you cannot do causal inference on those people because you cannot think of, you know, if I hypothetically change this person to another treatment, okay? It, and in practice, this usually means that how similar the two, two groups look like in their covariates, in their baseline characteristic, okay? So this assumption is testable. You can test it. You can check that how the two groups looks in terms of various baseline characteristic, right? So it's testable. It looks much more uh, it, a very simple assumption and testable. So people take it for granted. It turns out that causal inferences need both. Okay, so, but like people don't realize how important overlap assumption is. Essentially, if you don't have this overlap, then you're, you're, you cannot do cause inference. That's just, just like the mathematically, you will have a large uncertainty. And uh, conceptually, you cannot even define what is your causal effect. Okay, so that's the background. So now back to what uh, uh, Wang and Bly, as this paper, uh, sorry, I'm just checking how much time I have. Okay, so, they are what this paper claim essentially this claim is well because people are uncomfortable with unconfoundedness so one Bly say that well no problem we can bypass unconfoundedness assumption by imposing so when you have many treatments like not only treatment a b but a b c d e f g when i have many a treatment outcome um, relationship. Again, the, the paper is more complex than that, but I've just give you a, a kind of idea. So you, you pro impose this kind of machine learning, this is a factor model, again, low rank representation is a common technique in machine learning of the treatment outcome relationship. And then because of that, we can bypass unconfoundedness. So they call it 
the blessing, that's why the paper original name is the blessings of multiple causes, multiple causes, multiple treatments. So the, the point is that when you have many treatments, you do this factor model, and then you can bypass unconfoundedness. Well, and they got it to Jatha and then got discussion. And, uh, <laughs> and well, and this paper, again, attract a lot of attention. However, the paper, if you are a causal person like me, the first time I read this paper, I already noticed that this just is trying to do something uh, impossible. It ignored a common sense. The key thing is overlap assumptions. So again, it focused on by uncompounded. But in causal inference, without overlap between different treatments, causal inference is impossible. You can show it mathematically, you can show it conceptually. Okay? So what Juan Bly tried to do, essentially, they attempt to bypass unconfoundedness at the inexplicit cause of violating overlap. They didn't realize, you know, when you have many, many treatments and, and it's become less and less likely every unit, every patient will be likely be, have non-zero probability being assigned to each of them. Okay, there'll be less, so essentially you have less and less overlap. So this is simply wrong. As I mentioned earlier, in, in order to do cause inference, you need both assumptions. Even though one assumption is more an upfront subject to uh, scrutiny, but the overlap is taken for granted, but that doesn't mean it's not important, okay? So this is again, from the first time I read this paper, I realized that something's wrong, right? So cause inference needs both. So that's why I say that when you have multiple causes, multiple treatment, you are basically breaking more and more breaking the overlap assumption. So to me, this is not blessing, this is curse, actually curse of multiple causes. So it turned out that, you know, I'm not, not alone. So this paper, I would say that it's pretty comprehensively debunked theoretically and empirically by multiple researchers in cold inference. I just mentioned a few here, uh, uh, Alex uh, Damo in 2019 AI stats and the Miao et al. in the, a recent paper of JASA. And so, so again, from, if you are from the cold inference field, you know that this paper is debunked. However, to my, to my dismay that I still see plenty of follow-up wo work based on this paper in the machine learning uh, literature. I was, I was asking myself, what's going on? You guys probably should like read a little bit of the causal literature. It's, it's not, you know, if you have any kind of <laughs> common sense in causal inference, you probably would not do some work based on a flawed paper. So that's the first one. A second one is machine learning for uh, instrumental variable. So instrumental variable or IV is probably one of the most popular tools for causal inference in economics and social science. So what is IV? IV is an instrument. Uh, well, the, so what is an instrument? So instrument is basically, uh, an instrument need to, what's the pun? So instrument is like a natural experiment. So instrument itself is, has no, so it needs to satisfy several assumptions. So first it need to, affect the outcome, but only through its effect on the treatment. The point is that the instrument variable itself should have no direct effect on the outcome, but it will affect the treatment. And then because of that, it will affect the outcome. So itself need to be randomized unconfounded. Well, the question is, how do we find an instrumental variable? So normally economists have a lot of clever ideas and find this nature experiments, like the birth, when you're, when you're born in, in a year, that kind of thing. So it's like a nature experiment. Uh, and the nice thing is like, if you can find a good instrument, you don't need unconfoundedness, this uh, problematic unconfoundedness assumption I mentioned earlier, right? Um, so the, uh, the estimator of the, if you have a good IV or a couple of IV, you usually do this uh, analysis is very simple. It's this thing so-called two-stage least square assumption, 2SLS. Two, two um, so the first stage uh, regression is you regress the treatment on the IV. And then you predict the IV from this model. And then in the second stage, you use the outcome. You regress outcome on the predicted treatment from stage one. So that's two stage. Again, it's a, it's a huge literature. Um, so the, uh, but again, it's, uh, it's like, it's viewed particularly in econ views as less controversial because you found this IV thing. So you don't need to assume there's no unmatched confounding because the key point is that if you have a good IV, the IV take care of unmatched confounding. So of course the biggest challenge uh, in using this is how do you find the good IVs, right? They are hard to come by. 
uh, and here, this is really a data problem or empirical problem. The data and modeling cannot solve, cannot give you, you know, a good IV. IV is something that 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 uh, you go to find. It's it's so. But but the, then in recent years, I see that. But mathematically, again, this two state least square framework. So I see a, a slew of papers on adopting machine learning methods for IV analysis. Mostly, the most idea is okay. Remember, the IV analysis has two stage regression. So in both case, in both stage, you have a regression, right? Of course, in both stage, you can imagine the regression have a lot of covariates um, you can choose from. So I see most of work in this is actually to use the lasso or model selection type of approach actually to select the um, uh, selection the regression models in first stage or second stage. Okay, so there's a lot of this kind of papers and a lot of fancy math, and so then. Josh Angrist uh, have a recent paper. He actually had this paper in 2019. Of course, uh, jo Josh Angrist is, has just won the Nobel Prize in economics last year for his contribution, actually mostly in instrumental variable and labor, uh, labor, statistics, uh, labor economics. So this paper, it's, uh, I just, uh, just published. Again, in econ, it takes years to publish paper. <laughs> so this paper was original, I think, in 2019. And now it's just, the, just published in the Journal of Labor Economics, the top journal in labor economics. And so you can see that the, the, the um, OK, so I just quickly read. So they, so, so they summarize, basically it's say that utility of machine learning for regression-based causal inference is illustrated by using Lasso to select the control variable for estimate. OK, uh, so again, you have, in this case, what they're doing is that they have this two-stage regression and they have many covariates, so they use Lasso to, to select that. So anyway, so what they find is, you know, what they find is that machine learning seem to use for, for instrumental variable first stage. The first stage, remember, is to use the um, IV to regress the treatment on IV. And since two CD square bias reflect overfitting, so, but, but the key point is, I, I'm just keep reading, the key point they find is that while machine learning based instrumental instrument selection can improve on two CD square, well, sample splitting IV or limited information uh, maximum likelihood, those are like two traditional methods. You don't need to do any like machine learning or it's just, just the sample splitting or restricted uh, uh, maximum likelihood. So can we do better? Their point is that, you know, they find that, you know, machine learning, those lasso based uh, IV analysis is not necessarily better. Actually, it's not, it's worse than the just simple sample splitting. And also they find that machine learning creates artificial exclusion restriction. Again, res exclusion restriction is one of the key assumptions in the IV analysis. So they find that when they do the IV selection, use machine learning, actually it can create artificial exclusion restriction generating uh, spurious findings. So the conclusion is off balance, machine learning seem to be ill suited for IV application in labor economics. Of course, I don't want to say that, well, because Josh Angers say this, then I believe in this. That's not the case. But my own experience is that what he found is not surprising at all, given the problem. Like the, when you do the machine learning is the black box and causal, causal inference, on the other hand, the key thing is actually you want to make sure, that make clear, implicit all the assumptions. There's a clash in the, there, okay? So this is second example. Um, so I'm getting close to my end. Okay, so just take away. Again, so the fundamental challenges called the inference are mostly in the design stage, uh, not the analysis stage. I would say that this common, common uh, knowledge is, well, or consensus in the field is good designs trump fancy analysis in called the inference. Um, so machine learning is a predictive enterprise. It, it's really beautiful predictive. So it's not directly beautiful causal inference. And I would say machine learning is, especially deep learning, is extremely helpful with big and complex data. So it is very important. Like so, causal inference still haven't been used much for like text in the in the uh, text uh, analysis, text data analysis, or imaging. So in those fields, I can see that merging this you know, use the machine learning method will help a lot because traditional um, regression or whatever cannot do the job, right? So the, uh, so the key thing is like with good designs, then machine learning models can really help to refine called the uh, analysis can actually do extract information uh, from big and complex data. However, on the other hand, if you 
in the traditional methods like IV, I, I see the, and also the first analysis I, I mentioned, example I mentioned, in many problems, if you automatically just apply machine learning to causal problem and think that, well, this will automatically solve everything. And without understanding the core causal challenges can actually often do more harm than benefit. And so, so I, Okay, I guess my final message is that I think the machine learning and causal inference, again, it sounds like doom and gloom, but really I actually appreciate a lot of uh, development new methods in machine learning and deep learning. I think the key thing is this, the two fields need to talk to each other and actually need to, both fields need to learn deeply into the other field. Only that and then join force and learn from each other. Only that you can actually come up with some good methods to do the, uh, to solve the common challenges rather than just you know automatically doing things just applying uh, whatever the uh, newest deep learning model into a causal problem in hand that's it thank you